Hello, my name is Storm. This talk, called The Great Transition, was first given at the Probe Conference in Blackpool in October 2010. It starts off describing my own personal journey. My journey started almost 20 years ago when I asked a seemingly simple question. The question was, what is consciousness? At the time I was a scientist, so I looked to science for the answers. But this quickly wore thin. I then went on to look at metaphysics and spirituality and had a religious quest which resulted in a spiritual experience. After this experience, I contacted a being called Zenshi, a Wanjina being. Zenshi gave to me something called Life for Harmonics or metaphysics of consciousness, which led on to Masinchi theory, which is a theory of consciousness. This in turn lent on to the founding principles of the Tribe of the Phoenix, the seven core concepts. The Tribe of the Phoenix is a future vision of reality, of human reality, a new golden age where people will have seemingly supernatural powers and live in peace and harmony with each other, the planet, and all the other inhabitants. My journey began on a very particular date. It was the 5th of November 1991. The reason I remember this is because I was at a Photosoc AGM. I was an undergraduate student at Aberdeen University studying biochemistry, but I was also very interested in photography. So at this AGM, we discussed the usual type of things you discuss at AGMs such as the itinerary for the following year and who's going to do what in the committee. We then moved on to discussing what we did during the holidays. And many of us there were great fans of malt whiskey. I loved Glenfiddich and a couple of people had just discovered one called Lefroy because they said it was very good. After this we moved on to discuss what else we did. And I'd watched the film Terminator 2. And one of the main principles of the plot was that a computer called Skynet, a computer which was a neural network computer, a very advanced one, which was created by the US military was switched on and had made an instant decision that the best thing to do was to destroy the human race. Now this led to the question whether computers could actually become conscious and aware and able to make decisions. But this led to the question what is consciousness? <laughs> this is a question which deeply disturbed me because we've been taught in this society and by science that consciousness is no more than neurons firing in your brain it's a phantasm, an illusion so when I walked home that night I was very disturbed I thought am I just a collection of neurons firing in the brain if I were to stop thinking, would I cease to exist? So this led to a quest. And my quest started with science as I was a scientist. I started by looking at the new physics with the Heisenberg uncertainty principle which states that you cannot know a particle's momentum and position absolutely. Therefore, the mind of the observer influences the quantum world. But the amount about consciousness and what the nature of consciousness was in science is virtually nil. They sidestepped the issue. So instead I turned to more philosophical things and more open-minded scientists such as Fitzgerald Capra and looked at people studying the supernatural. And this eventually led on to psychology and psychologists such as Jung but still it didn't come up with a reasonable explanation what consciousness was. 
So I then got into spirituality and studied everything from Wicca to astral projection to guided meditation. And eventually this led me to Zen Buddhism, which deeply held my interest. And it's during 1992 that I started my postgraduate studies at Aberdeen University. I was studying the molecular structure of the immune system and strange synchronicity as I was using the same type of computer, Iris Indigo's, as was used in the Terminator 2 film. But I was more interested in the question, what is consciousness? I got very into Zen Buddhism and I went along to this place. This is called Throssell Hall Buddhist Monastery. It was founded in 1978 by an English woman who went to Japan to train in Sojiji Temple, one of the biggest training temples in Japan. Her name was Reverend Roshi G.U. Kennett. I was at a particular retreat here called the Jukari Retreat, which was on the 7th of April 1994. And during this retreat there was a ceremony and I had a spiritual experience what in Zen is called a Kensho in other traditions it's called a Kundalini experience and during this Kensho I was taken to another level of consciousness totally beyond of what I'd experienced or ever experienced since but it opened my mind to new possibilities and a new way of thinking in fact in Zen and Rinzai Zen the whole idea of having a question is called a koan and this question occupies your mind and acts as a catalyst for what they call enlightenment. To me my koan is what is consciousness. This led on to a deep interest in the question and I used to go for long walks in 1995 once I'd finished my postgraduate studies. I went down Girdle Ness which in the south of Aberdeen just some lovely coastal scenery. I also went into Aberdeenshire countryside, places like Benihi. I used to think a lot. And I eventually thought I'd better write things down. So I borrowed a typewriter and the information came through thick and fast. It came through faster than I could type almost. And eventually it led to the formulation of a book called Life for Harmonics, which is the metaphysics of consciousness. Life for Harmonics itself was split into many sections. It acted, as my guide Zenji said, as a framework for the rational understanding of the multi-dimensional reality. What he means by this is at the beginning it starts off by describing cosmology, what the universe is like. Then it goes into looking at the microscopic aspects of the human body and mind system. Then it builds up by integrating these together and showing how the mind and the body are related and eventually it leads to a, a theory of consciousness which I call Masenchi theory which means manifestation of synergized chi or life force and I mentioned my guide Zenchi at the time I was more interested in the information but I did ask Zenchi who he was and where he came from and he said he was a Masinchi master, working with consciousness. He was very old and he came from a system around the star Deneb, which is a blue-white supergiant star at the other side of the galaxy. And from here, it looks like it's in the Cross of Cygnus, one of the brightest stars in the sky, and it's also part of the Summer Triangle in the Northern Hemisphere. Cygnus also lies deep within the Milky Way. This became more significant a couple of years ago, back in 2009. I'd also had a strong interest in Australia. My grandfather was Australian born, and it turns out that he was actually a member of what is known as the Stolen Generations, which between 1869 and 1969 Children were taken from their parents, native Aboriginal children this is, and rehomed either in white foster families or 
in institutions run by the church and they were indoctrinated and cut off and it was an attempt at genocide to destroy the Aboriginal way of life. Dilute down, literally, by genetics, dilute down the Aboriginal gene pool. So it's an attempt at genocide. But I became interested in playing the didgeridoo and all things Aboriginal. As during this time, I was researching storytelling. Stories like how the kangaroo caught its pouch, which was the story my grandfather used to tell me. But when researching this, I found a story about the Wanjina. Now, the Wanjina are sky gods. In the traditions in the Kimberley region in Australia, the sky gods came down from the Milky Way. The main one, Wollongunda, came down, walked down the Milky Way, and created the earth and all the inhabitants. And it is said he looked around him after creating mankind and thought to himself, I'm going to need a hand here with all this. So he went up the Milky Way and brought down all his friends, the Wanjina. It turns out that Zenchi is one of these Wanjina beings. And a picture I showed you before of Zenchi. When you look at this in new light, because I drew that picture many years ago, at least 10 years ago. When you look at it in the light of the Wanjina, which I've just found out about, you can see there are many similarities. For example, there's lightning drawn the top of his so-called hat. And this is often associated with Wanjina. They're often associated with lightning or rain. The large hat obscures Zenchi's face and his features. This is because the Wanjina look a bit like the greys. They have large black eyes and and absent mouths because he actually used to communicate telepathically. This might have been my subconscious blocking out what he actually looked like but leaving me the impression of a very large head. Also the Wunjina carried with them something called the Dreamtime Snake which looks this structure here which I thought was just somebody clasping their hands was actually a Dreamtime Snake which is an Earth Goddess. Not only was I in contact with Zenchi, I was in contact with a whole group of guides who worked with him. And one of these guides was called Anshad, who appeared to me as a Native American medicine man. Now Anshad was not a Native American medicine man at all. He was from the future. He was one of the elders of the tribe of the Phoenix, who had come back in time to teach and tell me how the tribe of the Phoenix was going to be. The tribe of the Phoenix is a new enlightened tribal society. It's a society which is going to emerge out of the ashes of this current society we live in now. Now if you think about it, the word tribe often thought that a tribe is all to do with living close to nature in a very native way. But the word tribe is a social group organised through kinship rather than through imposed state government and regulations and we're seeing with the whole free man on the land movement a return to common law instead of all this imposed legalities rules and regulations from governments from the legal system from what you might call contractual law In the tribe of the phoenix the tribe refers to the way society is organised. It's going to be organised through kinship rather than imposed by states and by governments and by things like that. The tribe of the Phoenix itself is going to be a group of individuals with a shared root as humans wishing to live together in harmony as sovereign beings and spiritual adults. If you think of that, a shared humanity in connection with nature is a cornerstone of the tribe of the phoenix to do with the levels of reality we all live in. We live as individuals, we live as part of the human collective at all sorts of levels from individual relationships like husband and wife and family relationships up to community relationships and all the way up to the whole of the human race. But above that we are actually part of nature, part of the planet, part of collective consciousness. A shared vision of freedom enrichment 
This is when we come free of our shackles and slavery we are currently bound by and we have a view of freedom, of individual freedom and enrichment. We do things like an artist paints a painting, not only for himself but to share with others, to enrich not only himself but to enrich the entire society. And with this comes integrity, honour and responsibility. Because with freedom comes responsibility. You cannot have your freedom and not act in a responsible way. Otherwise society would not work. And that is why we have a society at the moment which is full of laws and rules and regulations because people will not take on the responsibility for their own lives. Now I mentioned before that Life First Harmonics created the seven core concepts of the tribe of the phoenix. Now the first of these concepts is that we live in an infinite reality. There are in fact infinite dimensions. There are in varieties beyond our imagination and a dance of complex relationships. All reality on every level of existence is just thought that has been condensed. To begin with, there was pure thought. This led to all the levels of higher consciousness and through many iterations and enrichment processes this led to the astral plane, the etheric plane and the physical universes. Ours is just one of these physical universes. Everything you see around you is no more than condensed thought. But not only do we live in an infinite reality the reality has infinite levels to do with scale, from the smallest things to the largest things. So we live on one axis in the levels of reality from condensation of thought starting with our soul and going down the different astral plane and our essence, person and sensory selves which are all part of our mind and in the physical. But each of these levels is represented in every single plane, if you like, of reality. The atomic world, the molecular world, the world of cells, the world we're used to, what we call our macroscopic world, but also the world of the planets and solar system, the world of the galaxies, all have their own rules and regulations, if you like, all have their own laws, all behave in the same way. An atom is superficially like a solar system, so there's a whole principle of reflection going through here, the macrocosmic and the microcosmic reflecting each other. In a sense, just as a rainbow is created by splitting light into its colours, a soul is created by splitting source energy into many divine sparks. The soul then creates a mind and finally the body. This gives rise to the different levels of mind, body and spirit that also was in the last slide. The astral self, the person, the sensory self and the essence. The second core concept is that physical reality is very rare and precious. This is because it's been condensed down and if you think of condensing things you need more and more of the substance you start with to condense down to smaller smaller bits. So if physical reality is the ultimate in condensation of thought then it's going to be rare. This was highlighted in a dream I had which I call the need for religion dream. In this dream I was walking through a meadow. It was a lovely sunny day and it's an idyllic scene. Then I came across an old chapel a very American type of chapel, the little archetypal little white chapel and around it was a white picket fence and the pastor was repairing this fence so I went up and asked him why exactly the fence was there and he told me it's to keep the badness out. Then I walked down the hill and there was a community of Zen monks walking along a very windy narrow dangerous road. They were heading towards a temple and I asked them 
why they were doing this, why they didn't go safely in a car. But they told me they had to do it and they were doing it as a community, as their safety in numbers. There's always a balance between protection because the ultimate role of religion is protection, one of the roles, and spiritual freedom. And the way these Buddhists have tried to reconcile this to maximize the spiritual freedom is all coming together as individuals on their individual path, but come together as community to minimize the risks. And this whole concept of risk from astral beings and beings out there, because of the sheer number of them, there are more things in heaven and earth ratio than are dreamt of in your philosophy from Hamlet is very apt. Not all these beings are friendly. There are many beings out there. Many are friendly. Many just try and avoid us. But some are very hostile. If you've ever seen the television programme Babylon 5, you'll be aware of the existence of beings called the Shadows. And also the Vorlons. Now the Shadows represented dark beings who destroyed and created chaos. They thought they were doing it for the good of the less enlightened species because they were millions of years ahead and they were trying to help these species to evolve. The Vorlons, on the other hand, were like angels and they wanted to help people by nurturing them and sherpadering them. Now the beings which are present on Earth at the moment, which are most important to this, are called the farmer beings. And they're a bit like maggots. Maggots eat dead flesh. They're recyclers. If you didn't have maggots and bacteria that eat dead fresh, then the world would quickly become heaped up with carcasses and dead matter. So maggots have a very important function. These farmer beings are maggots of the astral plane, but they don't eat dead flesh. They eat negative emotion. They recycle negative emotions and desires and try and turn them into reusable energy. But what's actually happened is because of so much negativity and destruction, low vibrational energies around, they've become very successful. And they've become so successful and intelligent that they actually now farm us, just in the way a farmer would farm cattle. They farm us for our negative emotions. And this was covered in my talk, The Great Deception, and is covered by people such as David Icke in depth. It's all related to controlling our minds through our person, who we are told we are, not who we really are. Now, the third core concept is that we are all cells in the body of the planet. If you think of it, we are made up of cells and we have lots of different levels of reality within us, from the cellular to the molecular to the atomic to the subatomic. And this is illustrated in the Sufi saying, God sleeps in the rock, dreams in the plants, stirs in the animals, and awakens in man. Now if you think of it, the rocks and minerals are like the connective tissues. They're like the bones and the muscles of the earth. The plants are like the major organs. It's no coincidence that we call the rainforests the lungs of the earth, for example. The animals are the nervous system. They're very reactive. And humanity is the highest part of the nervous system called the cerebral cortex, the place of higher thought. So we are all cells in Gaia's body. And to be in a human body, you're actually a higher brain cell. You're part of the grey matter, so to speak. This leads naturally on to the next core concept, which is the human collective mind is a mind of Gaia. If you think of it, if every level of reality is reflected in every dimension, then every cell will have a spiritual aspect. But so will the planet. This planet has its own soul, its own spirit. And as individuals and as a collective, we are part of this spirit. And humanity is actually what you might call the higher consciousness of the planet. It is 
the thinking part of the planet. That's humanity's role, that's humanity's collective role. Just in the same way as the animal's role is to be the rest of the planet's nervous system. And the plants are its lungs and its organs. But this leads to one of the big tenets of the tribe of the phoenix, which is a great circle. Individual humanity and Gaia. Because we exist on three different levels, or many different levels, but these three are the most important for us at the t this present time. As individual beings, as part of a collective humanity, part of the world itself. As we tune in to Gaia, as we realise this and see that we're not just individual little human beings in a box with a job and a name that has to do things, we see more and more, we become more tuned in to the subtle powers of nature. We can see the subtle spirits of nature as is, are illustrated in these two photographs, such as this nature spirit and this water sprite. The next concept is the universe is enriched by our experiences. This process of enrichment can be described as enrichment of the mind and the spirit. And each chakra, if we think of it, is connected to a different level of reality. The root chakra is all to do with basic security. And enrichment in that stage is just having enough food, water and shelter to survive. The sacral chakra is to do with sensual desire, to do with experience, sensual experience in the physical plane. Not just sex, but food, water, that kind of thing. And the solar plexus chakra is associated with the sense of accumulating things, wealth and power and things like that. It's to do with materialism. And these three chakras, if you like, constitute the lower part of the body. And this is the part of the body that came into manifestation during what you call the fall of man, which is when astral beings in the golden age wished to experience physicality or were duped into experiencing it because next up from the solar plexus is the heart and the heart is all to do with pursuing excellence and experience the heart is where people such as athletes come from trying to beat their personal best people who want to have adventures around the world and things like that and up from the heart and the first chakra of the higher body is something called the throat chakra. And this is all to do with expression. And this is where artists, poets, writers, musicians are coming from. And then on from there is the third eye. And the third eye is basically your vision. It is connection with a higher reality, a higher spiritual reality. It's associated with things such as psychic awareness and supernatural feats. And finally the crown chakra is the connection with spirit itself. And this process of enrichment has to happen in each chakra. It's not that one is better than the other or higher or lower than the other. It is that each chakra represents a particular point of enrichment, a particular thing, a particular experiences that you can have. The higher chakras are all to do with the experiences of the mind. And the higher chakras such as the third eye and the crown are to do with developing things such as concentration and supernatural abilities in this process of enrichment. But the lower chakras are just as important. Tantra, for example, is associated with the second chakra because it is to do with sex and sexuality. There's a scale of subtlety in each chakra. For example, you might get a very crass, bad, horrible film, which is an expression of the throat chakra, which is very dark. But you might also get the most wonderful symphony. It's all throat chakra energy, but at different levels of subtlety and different sort of levels of what you might call desirable and undesirable. Just in the same way as the second chakra, there's a whole pleasure pain dichotomy, whether something's pleasurable or something's painful, and some people lose track of this, and ultimately there's no distinction between pleasure and pain. But there's also a subtle 
level to each chakra, which you can develop in a way more than going up the chakras. It's a two-step process. You can work on one chakra and develop to the ultimate subtle level, or you can work up the chakras. And the will, each person has a chakra which is their limit. Root chakra, say if they're really having a hard time and just surviving, or it might be the crown chakra if they're epitome of enlightenment. But most people are somewhere in between. And a lot of people are caught in the lower three chakras. And one of the big changes which is now happening is that people are now coming through into the heart, into the higher chakras, because it occurs artificially into the lower chakras, because the lower chakra energies that these beings want to devour, so to speak. But it's not only lower chakra, it's lower chakra, less subtle energy. The more subtle energies you can't digest either. They want in the very low, quite basal energies. A Hamish mother, who was a great man, once said, that he met some Maori people who told him that the people in the tribe were so powerful that they could sit on top of a hundred foot cliff and tune into a single sound of a wave. They could use this concentration to actually change the structure of matter. And this is perhaps how monuments such as Stonehenge are built. People are actually thinking and changing the structure of the matter using the power of thought. And this is the sort of enrichment I'm talking about. The next insight, of course, is that Guy is part of a larger family. Just as we are part of the planet, the planet is part of the solar system. It has brother and sister planets in the father's son. It is also part of the galaxy. And you can think of the solar system as being a cell in the galaxy. So... The Earth is part of a cell which is part of the galaxy. And the galaxy is just one cell in the universe, and the universe is one universe, an infinite number of universes. And if you think about it, Gaia is our gateway to higher realities. If we tune into Gaia, if we connect with the Earth, we can bring the energy up. And it acts as an amplifier, almost like an antenna, so we can tune into more subtle levels of reality. We can tune in instead of just our very mechanistic astrology with planets and the sun. We can tune into far, far more subtle energies such as nebulae and galaxies. And the images that are coming from modern science, such as the Hubble Space Telescope and such like, providing these wonderful images of nebulae and things like that. These are very important because this is humanity tuning into the next level up, seeing through the eyes of the planet. Just as we can see stars and planets, Gaia sees the much more subtle things such as nebulae, galaxies, quasars, pulsars, exotic, astronomical things. I'd like to end with a vision of the future, which I call the Priestess of Gaia. A vision of the future, the priestess of Gaia. A tribal woman approaches a blue extraterrestrial craft. She is a priestess. She is Gaia's representative and is about to meet a spirit being from across the galaxy. In Aboriginal times, this being would have been called a Wanjina, a sky god, who walks down the Milky Way to help and to teach mankind. She knows this being as one of her spirit guides who brings much love and wisdom to the new earth. Over the years she has developed her subtle senses enough to perceive this craft and the being inside. These craft have been with humanity since their genesis and all's watch over. In dense times, such as we are currently living, such craft are only seen as brief glimpses by those momentarily sensitive to subtle energies. They are discounted by scientists and regarded as fringe phenomenon. They are described as UFOs, flying saucers, balls of light, fairies, spirits and ghosts. They exist on a level of reality that few can experience during our current order, 
that all will experience one day. In the time of the priestess, people will be able to see these subtle phenomena as easily as we see physical structures. They will interact on a level of love at a day-to-day -day level with all these beings. Some will develop their senses enough to board the craft and to be taken on magnificent journeys across the universe. They will be able to elevate their cellular and thought vibrations to such a level as to become transparent to the people of our current time as if ghosts. They will then see these beings and craft as solid and interact with them accordingly. They will use their minds to control the craft and travel in time and space in the subtle dimensions. They may be visiting us even now, but only a few will have the subtle sight to see them. Most will perceive only a flicker or a hint of colour at the corners of their eyes, or perhaps the feeling of a slight breath or the gentlest of touches. Such beings are regarded as angels in our time, but they are really just our descendants and ancestors. Some people alive today may be able to exist at this level. She is in harmony with nature and connects fully to the natural forces. We live in dense times, obsessed with time and rules and desensitization. We eat heavy food, listen to live music, are bombarded by images of bright colours and at the same time are insulated from feeling the sun on our skin or the moss beneath our feet. Tribal living is not retrograde, but the height of subtlety. Technology for a priestess is based on thought and direct manifestation. She lives a life of simple pleasures and as such is extremely sensitive. She can sense the pain of a daisy being picked. She can feel every blade of grass beneath her feet, every droplet of dew in her skin. Everything in her world would seem like soap bubbles to us, but is more resilient than the strongest of our buildings. This meeting is one of joy. Under a blanket of stars she greets her guide and friend. After a brief meditation calling down the subtle powers of the nebulae and galaxies, she is ready to board the blue craft. As she does so, she feels a rush of air and a sense of peace. Being in the craft is like being in a bubble bath or luxuriating on soft silk sheets. Taking her time to meditate with the crystalline energies, she holds a key to her third eye. The craft responds by gently lifting off, like a feather on the breeze. It rises into space and she looks down upon Gaia, her home. The sunlight shines through the craft, it is like being in a giant bubble. Her energies are too subtle to be harmed by radiation or solar winds, but she does feel the gentle caress of the particle stream. The craft moves swiftly on, past the moon and deep into space. The energies rise in vibration until the craft seems to disappear totally. It has entered a higher state, that of the etheric realm. Together with her guide, she pilots the craft through a sea of energy traveling across time and space until she reaches the shores of a beautiful planet. The planet is in an orbit around a giant blue sun. She lands a craft on the beach and it slowly crystallizes into a more solid form. Together they leave the craft and use the energy techniques to ground themselves and to solidify their forms. This is not astral travel, but the next level beyond. It is travel in mind, body and spirit. She is totally present and her physical body can solidify as much as your body is solid now. She walks along the sandy beach and reaches a settlement. There she meets other physical beings. They take many forms and are from all across the galaxy. This may sound fantastical, but it has been done before. In the Moorian times, beings travel from the Pleiades to Earth in such a fashion. By Atlantean times, they had begun to lose this ability, and by our time it seems like pure fantasy. But these abilities are becoming manifest. There has always been a few of us who could do this. The difference is that in the time of a priestess, everybody can.
Thank you for listening. I hope you find this useful. Please keep an eye on my YouTube channel for further videos and further talks. Thank you.